It now gives me great pleasure to introduce panel two, which is our workforce development panel. And your moderator for this panel is Walter Miller, Horizon City Economic Development Corporation. Mr. Miller is the former mayor of Horizon City and currently serves as an alderman with the Horizon City Council as the president of the Horizon Economic Development Corporation Board. He earned his bachelor's of science degree in agricultural economics from Texas A&M University and has worked as an environmental consultant in the El Paso South, Southern New Mexico area since 1990. Mr. Miller currently works as the client development manager at Terracon Consulting Inc providing public and commercial clients with environmental services, including indoor air quality issues, due diligence for property transactions, and NEPA documentation for federal infrastructure projects. Walter, you have a handful of work you do. Where is he? Oh, there you are, sorry. I'm going, where is he? He's working. <laughs> Mr. Walter Miller. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, really, really pleased to be here, pleased with this event uh, to put a little bit of uh, commercial for Horizon City. I've been involved with Horizon City for many years. We are in the middle of huge growth spurt right now, and it's driven by uh, investment from a lot of larger corporations. But as was said before, it all needs to be supported by small business. Horizon's always just about small business. And so I want to thank Eddie, Eddie for putting this together and for the Texas Workforce, for the governor's office for bringing it to us. Uh, this is a great event for Horizon City. Uh, today we're going to talk about workforce development. And that I know that as small business, that's foremost on most people's mind. Workforce is a continual challenge. And so, we have some folks here. I'd like to introduce uh, first Mr. Roberto Ransom. Roberto Ransom is the Director of Economic Development for the County of El Paso. Prior to this, he was worked for the State of New Mexico, which we will give that part a little bit. Economic Development Department, Office of Mexican Affairs and Trade, and with the Juarez World Trade Center as the El Paso Director promoting economic integration and strengthening the relationship between communities within the El Paso del Norte region. His most recent role was Operations Director for the UTEP's Hunt Institute for Global Competitiveness. Roberto strengthened the Institute's engagement at the regional and binational levels in the El Paso del Norte region by working closely with different university departments and federal and state government agency. Roberto obtained his BA in International Business and Computer Information Systems from the University of Texas at El Paso in 2005. So we want to welcome Roberto. We also have John Nunez, who is the Business to Business Administration for Western Technical College. He is additionally in charge of supporting the launch of Western Tech Collaboration with UTEP in support of an aerospace and defense training program. Mr. Nunez is a business focused, bilingual professional with a strong business acumen acquired through both training and experience. And as a surprise guest, we have business owner and my good friend Gary Garcia. No, not that Gary Garcia, the other one. Uh, Gary is, uh, is partner in Quinones Meat. Uh, a long time El Paso institution, uh, small, small business owner, and we are really pleased that he stepped in at the last moment to assist us with that. Gary is brings a unique uh, perspective to, as, as a business owner of workforce in El Paso. So with that, I'm going to Yes, over here. So we can begin with our questions this morning concerning all workforce development. And I'll start with you, Roberto. All right. What are the most, what are the events that have shaped workforce 
in El Paso County and the, and the region in the last five years? And how can the small businesses capitalize on them? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the organizers of this great event, uh, Mr. Eddie Garcia and Rafa. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the governor's office. Um, basically, I would like to uh, put it in context, uh, you know, the different events that we had had globally that basically permeate uh, small businesses here in the region. So I'll start off with uh, several events that uh, five years ago started to have an impact, a direct impact on the workforce. And as of today, you know, they still have uh, 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 an impact. No? The first one, you know, that started shaping things, uh, I think it was uh, the U.S.-China trade relationships, or as we know, the, the, the China-U.S.-China -China trade war. I think that the trade war open the eyes for many corporations to say, oh my gosh, you know, my, my product is gonna be very expensive coming from China into the US. So that, that, that was probably the first wake up call. The other wake up call, I think it was uh, the event of uh, the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19, uh, and then the, the, the full uh, effect of the USMCA taking place a few months after the pandemic. So basically that uh, on the corporate world uh, made that all these corporations uh, said, well, we need to tighten the supply chain. We need to reduce costs and uh, we need to basically go where uh, our final product is nearby. So all the direct foreign direct investment uh, globally started funneling through towards the US-Mexico border. Okay, and uh, where I'm going with this is because uh, communities like, um, let's say, uh, Tijuana, right? They don't have right now an economic indicator is they don't have industrial space. Uh, that is true as well for Ciudad Juarez and, and El Paso. Our industrial space is very limited. Uh, and that is also true for Laredo, right? Uh, in uh, Nuevo Laredo. Uh, so basically, that is an economic indicator. Then you also have the economic indicator of uh, the uh, energy use, water, elect electricity is just going up, right? So all of that, it basically, all that foreign direct investment funnels into these places and it permeates small businesses because we have more money going on in the community. So if uh, the direct, for example, there's a, if, if uh, your business, let's say, is directly in the sector of, uh, you know, transportation, where, you know, in Juarez or over here, the demand for, you know, uh, drivers and uh, freight forwarders is very high. If you are, let's say, in, uh, you know, construction, if uh, you are in the logistics sector, um, please let me know because I have extra copies of my resume. You know, you're, you, those businesses are going to be doing excellent. And, and then uh, all of the 14 big companies, corporations have these employees, right? And these employees basically have to, you know, uh, cut their hair, you know, once in a while. They have to basically uh, go to restaurants, uh, go to a bar. Uh, they have to basically, you know, ladies, they have to do their, their nails. So all of this is the ripple effect of the foreign direct investment uh, arriving into different places of the U.S.-Mexico border having a direct and indirect impact uh, in small businesses. So I think uh, those are some of the events that have shaped the corporate side and uh, how, you, you know, it permeates. Uh, on the on the small business side. Okay. So thank you, sir. And Mr. Nunez, what is your perspective? So I'm going to elaborate on what he just said. Um, so all these events are are bringing a lot a lot of jobs into the U.S. Um, I know some of these areas have not reached the El Paso region yet, but we can attract them if we create the right skill set. Um, employee that they can hire and some of the examples that i can talk about is one of the biggest ones is um, space exploration that's a big talk right now worldwide correct and i am surprised that um, a lot of el pasoans don't know that we're in the center of this 
Did you guys know that we, within a 150 mile radius of El Paso, we have two spaceports. One is up here in New Mexico, which is Spaceport America. Um, Virgin Galactic is working out of that one. And then in um, north of Van Horn, we have Blue Origin. Um, so both of these um, entities, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, what they're doing is they're working on space tourism. So just imagine that, the growth there, um, what the opportunities are for small business. Um, like you were mentioning, I mean, that's gonna be anything with hospitality related, you know, you have people that are coming in to do their space travel here, right? <laughs> so how, how can you fit into that? Um, and we have to provide the skilled labor. Um, one of the things that we're doing at Western Tech is we've actually been working with Blue Origin for about five to six years, and we've proven to them that we can create the skilled labor that is required for, um, for them to operate at a high level. And these are, you know, white collar jobs that they're going to be earning. They're going to be earning very high um, pay. Um, and then the other thing that I would like to bring to the table is collaboration. Um, I with the previous panel, they were talking about. You know, we're one village, we got to work together, but a lot of collaboration has to happen. We are a technical school, but we actually have partnered up with UTEP um, because when you create a career path, there's a lot of exit points in there. You know, we don't just need engineers, we also need technicians, right? So we each do our, our thing. So Western Tech creates the technician and the student can now go work as a technician or he can continue on with UTEP and become the engineer, right? Or he can go out into the field, work for a while and then come back and be the engineer. So it's kind of collaboration. We all work together to create those, those career paths and to build that skill set that is required to attract these companies. Um, another, um, another two big corporations that are here is um, Amazon is here. It, it is a warehouse, but there's a lot of technology in there that has to be maintained, a lot of robotics that has to be maintained, which we also provide skilled labor for, for those jobs, okay? Um, and I don't know the exact name of the other one, but it's also a warehouse that they also have technology. A lot of it is gonna be automated, is with TMAX, is that correct? Um, that, TJ Max, there, right? <laughs> Um, so that, that also will bring on, on jobs on the technical side. Um, so one of the biggest things is trying to build that skilled labor. Um, and one of the things we have to do in order to build that is we have to connect with the em employers, with, with the companies. What, what is required of, uh, um, for somebody to be hired with them? What skills do they need? and we have to communicate that with each other. Another example I can give of that is we're working, we're currently working with El Paso Electric. Um, if you didn't know, um, the United States is trying to upgrade their electrical grid, so that's gonna provide a lot more jobs. So we're working with El Paso Electric so we can create a program to get um, individuals to enter their, their program um, for linemen workers. So again, it's connecting with them um, and understanding what are the skills that are required and then we put a program together and provide those skills and bring everybody up to par to be able to take on those jobs. Okay. So one of the biggest things is just collaboration and communicating with each other on the academic side and on the industry side. Thank you, John. And John's been talking about the coming things, the new technologies and stuff. From the perspective of, of a tr more traditional, long-time family business, small business, Jerry, what what do you see as the changes that have occurred in the last five years that changed the workforce? I think for me, it'd be... Uh, Jerry, I'm if you sorry. could, yeah, there you go. I think for me, it would be uh, probably COVID for us because we're in the service part a service industry. and. When COVID shut down all the restaurants and all the events like these, uh, we were hurting. But we learned to uh, to survive by doing other services, helping restaurants deliver, helping, and when I say deliver, I mean home delivery. Uh, us as a company, 
we were concentrating on nothing but restaurants. But when all this started, um, the COVID started, we started doing home deliveries too. Helping restaurants do home deliveries and doing our own deliveries helped us survive uh, COVID. And I think you just got to learn how to adapt. That's the only thing I can think of. I wish my job was as exciting as these guys with, uh, <laughs> with robots and stuff, but our job is more manual, more, uh, it's not as appealing to the young, uh, younger people as it is, uh, you know, you make $20 an hour at uh, Amazon or whatever. So, uh, like the panel before was saying, sometimes you got to get up and do your own stuff. That, that, that's what we did to survive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, which kind of segues into the next question, which is what are some of the key soft and hard skills you've seen that are critical for micro or small businesses, business owners in El Paso and why? And that's more to how do you deal with, it's gonna have, how do you deal with the new employee that we're, that we're getting in the workplace? Uh, yeah, Jerry, you can start with that one. Cause right, well, for me, it's like I said, it's, we're physical works. Uh, you have to cut me, you do it by hand, you, you grind ground me, but you gotta be lugging. I'm sorry, I'm talking nothing about my industry, but that's what I know. Um, I think, like I said, it's not as appealing to the younger crowd as it is to a person like us. When we were growing up, it was a trait. It was something we did. And we tried to do it well. Uh, that, it's tough. It's really tough out there right now. Okay. And John? So, and this part, um, soft skills is the biggest thing that comes up, right? Um, we got to get them to be able to be effective communicators, right? Be able to communicate with their team members in order to get the project done. Um, but soft skills is probably the biggest thing that we get feedback from our graduates that are going out into the field from the employers. They don't have that effective communication, they lack it. Um, we have to figure out how to build that up. Um, also, to work in, as a team, to be able to collaborate with each other. How do we work with each other? How do we share skills? You know, you're better at this, so you do this. Um, you, you're, you're better at that, you do that. You have to kind of figure out who's, who's good at what, like I said. Um, so in a rapidly changing world, adaptability is another big one, okay? Being able to adapt. Um, because the way things are done today, within two to three years, it's gonna change completely. And then we have things like COVID that come about and kind of advance the progress of, of, of change. We, we have to create new change. We have to adapt to the new changes. Right. Um, Would you not mind repeating the questions so just uh, so I can focus what, on What are them. some of the key soft and hard skills mm -hmm. you've seen that are critical for micro and small business owners in El Paso County? Okay. Um, so working in my previous capacity, uh, it, it, it was, uh, like, like you mentioned, it, it was a research center that it was under the umbrella of the university. And uh, this research center, basically, we, we did uh, market demand assessments, economic impact analysis, uh, cost benefit analysis. And there was a, a very interesting project that we did where we analyzed uh, how businesses uh, responded to the pandemic, what businesses raised their hand and said, I need a loan, right? Uh, what businesses basically tap into that and they responded a survey, okay? So the data that uh, this study reflected was number one, uh, that we are 83% Hispanic, right? And because of the culture that we have, we see as a last resource, the access to capital through a lending institution, 
number one. We'd rather ask our parents for a loan, el tío for a loan. We don't like to go directly to CDFIs or lending institutions. So that was the sentiment that we capture as a result of the uh, analysis that we conducted. And this, you know, had random places, you know, in uh, across the entire region. No? Um, so uh, the other thing uh, is uh, leveraging on what uh, the previous panel was mentioning. And uh, Cindy, I know that uh, the, the, the surveys that you did, uh, you know, were very important uh, during that time. Basically, um, and, and uh, Cindy knows this, you know, we identified in a different study that our businesses here in the region, they need uh, again, what they mentioned in the previous panel, how to budget. They need to know how to manage debt. They need to know how to take care of their credit score. Uh, they need uh, to know how to have a good ratio for savings. And uh, they need to know the amount of inventory ratio and equipment uh, that they need to have, right? Uh, so that is the rubber stamp of financial literacy. I'm not even speaking about a balance sheet here. So a lot of businesses, they need, they need that hard skill, you know, the, the financial literacy. And nowadays, the financial literacy goes hand in hand with the digital literacy. So you cannot file your taxes if, online if you don't know TurboTax, if you don't know how, I mean, how to scan a document, if you don't, I mean, things, just simple things like that, right? So um, businesses that are here today, you know, I would, I would definitely speak to Paloma Medina, you know, uh, the SBAs, the SBDCs. I would network and take advantage of that. And then, uh, so that is as far as hard skills, okay? Here, here you know, that, that we have seen uh, from analysis that this is a culture, this is actually what we have learned from, from analyzing uh, surveys here. The, the, the soft scale, uh, I think it goes along with what you were saying, John. I, I, I think uh, small businesses, they're so busy producing, serving, uh, making sure that uh, their business is thriving, making sure that today I, I close that sale, making sure that I, I bring the inventory that I, in, in all the operation, but they need to have the time for them to approach a technical a center, a technical college where they know how to do, you know, their, their financial literacy again and uh, have any questions that they have, how to tap into loans, how to, you know, like polish that business plan. I think this we have been hearing uh, along the way and, and uh, Mr. Hector Villarreal from the banking sector is there. So I would network as well. I will take opportunity that he's here today. I would speak as well and network with him. And, and basically communication and the, the determination from small businesses as far as reaching out to those resources and making sure that um, you have those soft skills that you know how to network, that you know how to do an elevator pitch of, of your business in front of those CDFIs and polish the, that business plan and then you mentioned about generation right also I, I think right now you know we have um, you know the generation X uh, you know generation millennial and just knowing being aware of the first of all the generational gap right uh, you know from from a baby boomer to a generation X to a millennial knowing that, uh, you know, the, the different characteristics, and this is not difficult, just Google it, you know, and, uh, you know, identifying the tendencies of your employees. And, and, but I, I also think that the soft skill of knowing the personality of your employee, you know, if it's phlegmatic, if, it, if, if it's active, if it's a dreamer, if it's a controller, if it's an analyzer, um, if, if, if it's, uh, let's say, uh, I'm, I think, uh, uh, dreamer, controller, analyzer, I'm missing one. But, uh, you know, the point is know the personality from how you can motivate that person. Uh, so I think that's a combination in a nutshell of the hard skills, you know, like, you know, the, the financial, the di digital, knowing how to file your, your, your taxes, uh, soft, know, you know, knowing how to approach these banks, these lending institutions, 
uh, having the determination to go to a technical college and, and basically receive that feedback. And, and, and Jerry, you know, I think, you know, you're, you, I mean, your position is great. You know, it's a great time to be a small business. It's, it's exciting to see how your business is thriving day by day, how you, when you secure a sale, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'll send you my resume, you know? <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's my two cents. And, and I might comment also in, in my current role with Terracon, I, I and come into contact with lots of young engineers coming out of uh, UTEP primarily. Uh, very, very adept, uh, very well trained, technically excellent. I do notice that particularly with the younger generation and you have to learn how to marry this, they are digit digitally involved. They don't have the soft skill of communication. Uh, how do you approach Clients, how do you meet with clients one-on-one? -on -one? How do you feel comfortable talking to your customers, basically? Because they live in a digital world. And uh, not all of their customers, some of their peers will be their customers and that's fine. But how to communicate with a, with a generation that doesn't rely on, on technology as much. It's, it's a, you have to be patient with your with your, uh, the, the technically aware and get them to come into your world. But there's a lot of patience involved with workforce development also, so. Uh, the third question we have here is, what are the positive and negative aspects of hiring and developing the workforce locally that you think uh, that might not be true of other areas or further away from the border. I mean, what are particular border issues we have uh, with, with uh, hiring folks and developing our workforce? Uh, All right. Over. Okay. So um, I think the, the positive aspects, it's uh, what, who we are as a region. We, we basically are the fathers of the, manufa the, the manufacturing the border industrialization program uh, back in 1965. Uh, we saw it here with, uh, you know, uh, President Diaz Ordaz in Mexico and uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, I believe, back in 65. You know, it was born here. So uh, I think the competitive advantage, the positive thing is the labor force that we have here is very acquainted uh, towards. Uh, manufacturing towards um, uh, basically uh, logistics, right? Uh, transportation, third party logistics, four party logistics when you engage a custom broker. Uh, so I think that is our competitive advantage as, as for the workflows of, of the region. And then you mentioned negative as well, right? Yes. Okay. So um, I think that. Uh, I'd like to add one one more section. I think we we have a, we have a challenge, you know, from passing to the positive to the negative. I think there's there's a gray area in the middle, where you have um, uh, a challenge, and this is not only for economic development or SBDCs or the chambers of commerce uh, by by themselves working in silos. I think we need to work together uh, as far as you know, knowing what entities doing what and how we can complement as far as far as again all that foreign direct investment all of that money that is flowing you know from those large corporations making sure that we groom our small businesses for them to tap into that line or in that stream of of revenue that is out there you know because for example, we're, we're, we're the second port of entry, the most important port of entry between the U.S. and Mexico uh, border after Laredo. I mean, so there's a lot of money going, you know, flowing, you know. So the, 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 the thing is just, you know, like John was saying, grooming those small businesses uh, in, in identifying the opportunities to tap into the money, uh, into, the, into the, the, the access to to, to capital, uh, to making sure that you have the, the, the resources in, in tapping to that stream of, of, of revenue, right? Uh, making sure that your business has the right backbone on the administrative side. So I think that's the challenge that we have. 
And then, you know, the, you know, the negative is, you know, we have always heard this, um, we're a manufacturing community, we're a distribution community, but um, the negative thing is sometimes we need to focus on jobs that are more value added jobs, like the aerospace that John, that John was mentioning, the white collar, you know, the, the high end technical uh, skills, high end, uh, you know, in, engineering skills that we need, that, that we need in order for us not to be a, a, an exporter of talent, you know, our, uh, the, the, most of our uh, university grads, they're serving, you know, uh, you know, in Dallas, Texas with uh, the big corporations and they leave, right? So I'm, I'm very happy to see that um, we have a lot of, uh, you know, demand for industrial because that has a ripple effect on small businesses. And, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I think the opportunities are there. And again, just on the negative aspect, I think we need to make sure that we have the talent and the skills to make sure that we tap into uh, the high value added jobs. Thank you. And John? So on the positive side, what we've seen a lot is, and I'm gonna use Blue Origin as an example, is the reason they reached out to us was because they were hiring a lot of people, but they were coming from other places like Florida, um, Seattle, and I mean, those are green areas, and then you come into this area and it's completely brown, right? So they were, I mean, after two, three years, they wanted to leave, they wanted to go somewhere else. So what they were trying to do is hire local um, people, and that proved to help their um, turn, turnaround on employees. And the reason is that we found out is, believe it or not, a lot of people that have grown up here don't want to leave El Paso, right? I, I hear these um, stories about there's nothing to do in El Paso, but El Paso is boring and whatever. But I've, I've seen a lot of people say, I'm leaving, they do leave, but they're back three, four years later, they're back, all right? Um, so if we can take our students or our high school students here and educate them and provide the skills so that they can stay here, they're gonna be um, excellent um, employees to hire, okay? Because they're gonna wanna stay here. They wanna grow with El Paso. That's what we see. We do work with large corporations and most of our jobs, to be honest, I'm, I'm going to say about 50% of the jobs that we have for our um, students are out of town. But believe it or not, a lot of them don't want to go out of town. They want to stay here. They enjoy it here. Okay, So that's where we have to start developing that, that the necessary skills to keep those um, people here. And at the same time, if we do attract larger corporations, it will filter down to everybody else. Um, that's where, as a small business owner, you will have to figure out what that industry is and how are you gonna adapt to support that industry. Because large corporations don't do it all by themselves. Um, on the previous panel, we were talking about outsourcing. A lot of their smaller jobs, they will outsource them to small business. Okay, And that's, that, that's where the opportunities are for small business owners. How are you gonna tap into them? Um, as a negative, I mean, again, it's adaptability. I mean, we're, we're always having changes in trade agreements, um, safety, if they decide to close the border or something, what are we gonna do? We have to adapt, right? Um, so part of that, um, one of the other industries is chip manufacturing. And that's one of the things that we want to help to attract into El Paso as well. Chip manufacturing has always been um, outsourced to other countries. So now there's an initiative to do it in, in the United States. So how do we attract that business here? And that does bring a lot of opportunity to small business because of the technology behind that. There's a lot of support systems that are required for that. So that's another opportunity that El Paso has. And what I've, I, working with large corporations outside of El Paso, they do like El Paso, but again, it's the skilled labor that they're looking for. And I think um, between all the 
schools here in El Paso, we can create the skilled labor that they, they need. I mean, El Paso is a great spot. I mean, we don't, a lot of businesses look, um, our, our weather, there's no shutdowns, right? We don't really have any natural disasters other than the wind storms that we get, right? Um, but we have the perfect location and we just gotta build on, on that. And that's gonna happen with collaboration. And that's, um, I'm gonna end by saying, if you guys have a need, if you need to educate your employees, take them to the next level to take you to that, to use that new technology, reach out to us. We'll figure out a way to, to get them there. Okay. Thank you. I think for me, the I'm going to do the negative part first. I think uh, the hard part is teaching kids the manual labor stuff. The plumbing, the the woodwork, the cutting the meat, because uh, in reality, like these two gentlemen have been speaking, uh, nothing but technology. Which I understand it's the wave of the future, but we still need plumbers, we still need electricians, we still need uh, guys that can build a wall. I mean, the negative part about that is, like I said, kids. They don't want to do that anymore. Everybody wants to be behind a computer, uh, behind the, the phone, working from home. Uh, I don't know. It's a, To me, I think it's down the line is going to be something that's going to be hard to replace. We'll switch jobs after this. We'll switch jobs after this. <laughs> yeah. And um, the positive is that I'm going to start off with a joke, and I don't know if it's a funny joke or not, but... Uh, they say that uh, in Egypt there's pyramids, right? And everybody questions how they were built. In Mexico, there's pyramids all throughout Mexico. And nobody questions how they were built. <laughs> <laughs> As as Hispanics here, we're hard workers. We're we're good at labor stuff. And if we train the right people to do the right jobs, I think we'll. I mean. It'll be something that uh, people can make some money at and, you know, make a living. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I see that, that I'm getting the signal over here that we're about out of time here, so I'll wrap it up. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Uh, we, we're very pleased to have you all here. Thanks a lot.